addition, the global suspension of refugee settlements has severe consequences on the functioning of the emergency transit mechanisms in Niger and Rwanda. These are just a few signs giving a forewarning of how the COVID-19 and its subsequent effects may aggravate vulnerabilities of migrants and refugees, as well as their family members and host communities. The expected economic downturn and decrease in remittances will only make things worse. Therefore, without proper policy response, the future migration and refugee crisis are almost certain. This will badly hurt the continent where mobility plays a crucial role, not only as a livelihood strategy, but also as a source of growth and prosperity. It is actually an irony of history that the year which was supposed to become a turning point in the implementation of the continental free trade area and in the process of ratifying the African Union Free Movement Protocol is becoming a symbol of immobility. 2020 was also meant to be a year when the European Union, African Union partnership would take further boost, especially after coming into office of a new European Commission, whose president's first official visit took place in Addis Ababa. The participation of a high number of European commissioners in the February EU, EU college to college meeting was another symbolic sign that the EU meant it serious with intensifying its partnership with the African Union and its member states. The vision of bringing these partnerships to new heights was set by the European Commission in its March communication called Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa. In this communication, the European Commission sees the EU, EU relations built on five partnerships. And one of these should be a partnership on migration and mobility, covering the cooperation on addressing the challenges of forced displacement, irregular migration, return, readmission and reintegration, as well as cooperation on legal migration. This vision was supposed to be discussed and refined at the 2020 AU-EU Ministerial and AU-EU Summit. However, the COVID-19 crisis has already triggered the postponement of the AU-EU Ministerial and holding of the AU-EU Summit is linked with further uncertainties. More importantly, it is still not entirely clear how the COVID-19 crisis will affect the migration and mobility partnership between African Union and European Union. It is very important to note that one of the aims of the EU's global response to the COVID-19 from April 2020 is to focus on the most vulnerable people in Africa, including migrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, and their host communities. This is certainly the right step into the right direction. At the same time, this might also give a sign about the direction in which the AU-EU migration and mobility partnership might be headed in the years to come if the COVID-19 continues to generate further vulnerabilities on the side of migrants, refugees, and host communities. Against the above background, it is of great importance to discuss the key issues relating to the effects of COVID-19 on migration, mobility and displacement in Africa, as well as its possible impact of the future AU-EU partnership on migration and mobility. I hope that today's webinar will make a good contribution to these discussions and wish you all interesting and insightful event. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Director General, for your uh, opening statement and the scene setting.
I would um, like to remind everyone that questions will be able to be asked, uh, can be sent during the session via the question and answer button at the, at the lower screen, lower part of your screen. Um, and I would now start the debate with um, our three commissioners. Uh, our first question will focus on the current impact of COVID-19 on migration, mobility and displacement in Africa, as well as in Europe and the policies and responses which have been taken both in Africa and in the EU. Um, um, Your Excellency Al Fadil, could you provide our audience with a short overview of the main impact COVID-19 has had on migration related issues in Africa and also which policy initiatives were undertaken already as a reaction to this development? Commissioner Al Fadil, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, good morning uh, to everybody, the participants. Uh, good morning. Um, COVID-19 uh, is affecting everybody. It's affecting every continent, and uh, it's really impacting our economies, impacting uh, our social life. So the impact that's happening in Africa or in Europe, and it's really the same impact. It's a, it's a global pandemic and it's affecting all of us. But I can reflect briefly on uh, how the African Union is fighting COVID-19 uh, in Africa. And I uh, would like to start by saying that the first case reported in Africa, it was on the 14th of February in Egypt. And uh, this is the first case reported in the continent. We were following what's happening in China before this reported case. But one week after the first case reported in Egypt, we convened as African Union Commission and Africa CDC an emergency meeting for the ministers of health in Africa. And more than 40 uh, ministers attended the meeting. It was physical at that time before the lockdowns. And also uh, WHO was invited to the meeting, the director general uh, Dr. Tedros uh, participated uh, through VCT. Um, the regional director came herself, Dr. Uh, Moedi, and there is also a representative uh, from Imro region uh, plus Afro region. This meeting is a very important meeting because in this meeting we adopted with the ministers of health the joint continental strategy on COVID-19 in Africa, which is later being endorsed by the Bureau of the Assembly of the Heads of States and Governments. So for Africa, there is a joint strategy agreed upon from the beginning, and the Heads of States and Governments also, they agreed that Africa will fight COVID-19 together uh, in solidarity and in unity. And also, they decided that the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention as our uh, main technical institution uh, in the area of uh, fighting diseases and outbreaks, the Africa CDC tasked with uh, leading this fight on the technical level. So we have, from the beginning, a clear vision on what we want to do as Africa. We have, from the beginning, the political will backing us up as uh, Africa CDC, and also we have the support from our principals within the African Union Commission, His Excellency Musa Faki, uh, the, the chairperson of the African Union Commission and the WT, plus all the commissioners. We are acting together as one because this COVID-19 fight is not, also, it's not only in the area of health. It is a fight that everybody should play a role uh, in, uh, in it so we can win it together. The thing also I wanted to mention uh, at the beginning uh, that Africa CDC uh, formulated a task force and I see it being mentioned, all this information, I see it mentioned in the concept note for this meeting. Yes, Africa CDC, they established a task force, a technical task force. In this technical task force, the 55 member states of Africa have a participant either the permanent secretary of the Minister of Health or uh, an expert in the area of uh, epidemics, 
So they are in different levels, but every member state is represented. This task force is where the main uh, technical decision is uh, taken. And we are uh, convening this task force twice a, a week under the supervision of the director of Africa CDC. Uh, it's a very regular meetings. Member states, uh, we have even invited partners. It's not only there were member states. We have opened it for partners. We opened it for uh, international organizations. We are also opening this task force meeting for uh, the CDCs like Europe CDC because me, um, I attended one of, or, or two of these meetings. I, I saw our, uh, Europe CDC as part of this meeting, America CDC, China CDC. So it is uh, a platform for the member state, but also we are opening it for our partners to debate on what decisions to take, what measures to take. Well, if you, if I want to add to this that uh, we are on top of the issues, yes, this pandemic is not easy to control. The virus cannot be controlled. Till today, there is no vaccines. Yes, there is clinical trials in some member states of Africa, in Europe, in America, in China, but till today, there is no vaccine. And till today, there is no uh, licensed uh, treatment for COVID-19. And this is the biggest challenge we are having now. That means with no vaccine to be developed, with no uh, medical uh, treatment uh, or medicines, that means this COVID-19 is going to stay with us for a while. And this is also a very big challenge to all of us, to you, to us. When we speak about the impact of this COVID-19, on the vulnerable groups. And when we say the vulnerable groups, it includes the migrants, it includes the refugees, the IDBs, those who are not, even the labor migrants. And uh, living in Addis Ababa, we saw that member states are bringing um, large numbers of migrants. They have been deported uh, to Ethiopia from many countries. We see it between the African member states themselves, we see it, everywhere we see that the risk for these groups migrants refugees and idbs they have two folds of risk the first risk is that they don't have the same accessibility to the measures being taken by member states and i will give an example we uh, initiated uh, testing uh, an initiative called pact pact is partnership for accelerating of testing in africa because through testing we can trace the infected cases through testing. We can isolate the, 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 the infected uh, persons. We can start them or put them on treatment. When you speak about refugees or IDBs or migrants, especially those who are uh, in the category of the irregular migrants, they don't have the same opportunity like uh, the populations in the countries, whether countries of transit or countries of destination they don't have the same accessibility to the, cell, to the health services. This is the challenge. The second challenge, even when they put the measures of, the simple measures of washing hands, wearing a mask, uh, observing social distancing, it's also, it's very difficult for these uh, populations because they are already lived in a very cramped and crowded areas. So even the simple measures, they cannot apply it. Some of them, they don't have the luxury of having running water, so to wash their hands or to have uh, the soap or the materials needed, they don't have the mask. So the risk is very high on this population. This is, this is the first risk. The second risk they face that when countries of residence decide to deport them in, or, or to, to take them to their countries of origin without even uh, giving them the enough testing they need, without uh, informing them, without uh, giving them the opportunity to choose. So this is this one of the areas we need to discuss in this meeting. We need to discuss. On our part, we issued a communique protesting to this kinds of behavior. We spoke to some of these member states. We spoke to the ministers in charge. But we need also to discuss this issue of countries deporting migrants at this very difficult and risky time of COVID-19. And I, I'm just proposing this area so all of us, we can talk uh, about it. Um, today, we have more than half a million infected cases in Africa. Uh, 
we have around 11,000 uh, of deaths, but the recovery uh, is very high. The percentage of the recovered population is very high. Africa continue to be the least affected continent, but that doesn't mean uh, the risk uh, is minimum. No, the risk is still very high because we have only four countries in Africa, they have the 60% of the infected cases. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think, I'm sorry if I'm taking long, but I think we need uh, more solidarity uh, from uh, our neighbors in Europe. Mm -hmm. We need a global solidarity to fight this COVID-19. We need Africa not to be left behind. If vaccines mm -hmm. are developed in any part of the world, we want to make sure that vaccines will be accessible uh, and affordable uh, to everybody. Uh, my apologies if I'm taking long, uh, but it's my luck. I'm responsible about uh, migration, but at the same time, I'm responsible about uh, Africa CDC and health issues in, in the African Union. Uh, thank you very much, and then we have another opportunity to uh, reflect on uh, other issues. But mm -hmm. I would like to say that we need to continue our continent-to-continent uh, -continent, uh, dialogue on migration issues. We want to be even encouraged by this situation. Yes, it is a ch it's challenging. Yes, um, it is crisis time. But in every crisis, there is opportunities. And we need to continue our discussions. And we need to innovate uh, solutions on, the, on such kind of, uh, of, of situation. Thank you very much, Martin, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thank you for your... Um giving the whole overview of, of what already has been taken as, as, as measures and also the impact that, that COVID-19 has on uh, both the resident population but also on, on migrants um, and, and refugees. Um, Commissioner Samata, your mandate um, covers, among others, free movement and displacement issues. Looking back at the last uh, four months, what have been your main observations with regard to the direct impact of the pandemic on, on issues under your mandate. You're still muted, madam. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin. I would like uh, to thank you and to thank the Director General and the European Union for convening this uh, important webinar on our cooperation with the a a EU on the issue of migration mobility in light with of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, I would like to salute commissioners and all participants to this important uh, webinar. Uh, my presentation will complete uh, what uh, my sister Amira said about the impact uh, of uh, coronavirus on many sector and uh, it has affected uh, especially vulnerable person include, uh, including uh, migrants, as she said, refugees, returnees, IDPs, and stateless less, uh, people also. And the measure put in place to combat COVID-19 have uh, had uh, adverse impact on these vulnerable people. Unfortunate, unfortunately, some countries uh, were uh, experiencing disasters, uh, locust infestation, conflict, terrorist attack, and massive uh, humanitarian crisis coupled with COVID-19. These countries are more affected and um, despite uh, the repeated uh, call for a global, global ceasefire in the Wharton region during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, ongoing conflict, uh, terrorist attacks, and uh, uh, all kind of uh, situation is still happening uh, following this uh, conflict, especially in Libya, South Sudan, and Cameroon, and the Sahel region with uh, Burkina, Mali. Uh, they continue to face uh, uh, displaced uh, communities. It became a big, uh, a major challenge to fulfill uh, the AU team of uh, silencing the gun, uh, how we can create a conductive condition for uh, Africa's development. To tell you that uh, um, uh, co uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, is going on, but we still uh, have uh, this situation and uh, 
Unfortunately, we, we, are, we witness a confirmation of case of COVID among refugees and IDPs could community treat and risk to displaced uh, person. And uh, this situation became a reality in, uh, in uh, Africa. Across uh, Africa, authorities have taken strict uh, public uh, measures, health measures to contain the spread uh, uh, impact uh, uh, of COVID-19. This includes uh, lockdown, curfews, and many measures that this measure has a very difficult impact on uh, vulnerable um, uh, people, including the issue of uh, of uh, free movement, I will come back uh, as we will have uh, occasion to, to talk again. I will come back on uh, this issue of free movement with COVID. But uh, uh, you will uh, ask what we did ab about this situation. And uh, to complete uh, what uh, my sister Amira said, we have a briefing, we had briefing uh, with ambassadors and also peace and security and to urge our member state, our regs, Africa CDC and uh, World Health Organization, include uh, our humanitarian partner to adopt an, an, an inclusive, holistic and human rights based approaches that are uh, underpinning by respect for the sanctity of human rights. Uh, we realize that uh, we left these vulnerable uh, people. We, we appeal our member state to adopt an inclusive uh, uh, solution. And also we encourage our member state uh, to ensure that the effort being deployed by government so beyond addressing the immediate healthcare challenges caused by COVID-19 to also comprehensively address the broader socioeconomic impact uh, including effect on uh, nat of natural disaster, anger, and unemployment to, to be sure that we won't left anybody behind. We also engage our um, member state to ensure uh, the implementation of the global ceasefire and mobility member state to implement sustainable solution for durable peace and stability by addressing the root causes of forced displacement in, uh, in Africa. And uh, something also important, the creation of the fund. We have a fund to face this COVID and we appeal our member states to give a part of, important part of this fund to take care of uh, uh, these vulnerable uh, uh, people. We urge them to contribute uh, really, uh, in reality to be sure that we will uh, try to help our vulnerable uh, people. We urge also our member state to expedite the operationalization of uh, African humanitarian agency. We are, we are going to finish the process and we are waiting for uh, Office for uh, meetings of uh, organs to adopt uh, and to operationalize uh, uh, our agency. These are some issues uh, we did uh, to complete what my sister Amira said about uh, uh, the situation of COVID with uh, humanitarian challenges. Uh, and uh, African Union is still engaged uh, with member states. We said we have uh, our instrument if we implement and domesticate our uh, uh, legal instrument, especially the uh, a, uh, Kampala Convention and AU Convention on IDPs, we will find solution this, on this situation. These are some uh, measures taken by uh, uh, African Union to complete what uh, Amira said, and I will come back on the issue of free movement and how, what we can, uh, the way forward uh, uh, for the cooperation between the European Union and African Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, I would now like to go to uh, Commissioner Johansson. Um, Ms. Madam Johansson, the EU has uh, seen a major impact of COVID-19 on freedom of movement within Europe, but also with regard to migration to Europe. 
Could you maybe elaborate on the impact, the direct impact that COVID-19 has had on the EU and which measures uh, the EU and especially the European Commission has, has taken to address this? Madam Jones. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you ICMPD for inviting me for this uh, webinar uh, with the African Union. I'm very happy here to continue the good discussions I already had this February in Addis with the African Union Commission, including Commissioner uh, El Fadil. It's nice to see you again, Amira. And it's also a pleasure to meet virtually for the first time with Commissioner Samante. I think this pandemic has had a huge and still have a huge uh, impact on our societies uh, and in many, many aspects. And I think also that, of course, solidarity and acting together is of the essence to tackle this. And we will come back to, to things to, to do. But what I also would like to uh, stress is in Europe, we've seen uh, that how this pandemic has shown the important contributions uh, of migrants uh, in the European economy, in, uh, in the European society. For instance, in the health sectors, but also as essential workers in different important sectors. Uh, a lot of people with migrant backgrounds have been very visible how important they are for the uh, European economy. And we have also seen refugees all over U Europe volunteered to fight the virus. And this has been, I think, an important um, uh, uh, shown the importance that migrants in Europe are part of us. They are not part of them. They are part of our society, our economy, and we need them. But of course, this pandemic, we have also shown how it hits stronger, the most vulnerable people. And of course, that includes uh, many migrants, refugees, and displaced persons. And of course, this worries me a lot. Uh, we have overcrowded uh, migrant camps on Greek islands, for example, and this has been really a focus to avoid the virus to get into these overcrowded camps. And we have managed, actually, we have zero uh, case of COVID cases in these camps on the Greek island. And I think that that's very good. We have put a lot of effort to that. We can also see whether irregular migrants are arriving to Europe, they are put in quarantine and uh, we can see a growing number of them uh, coming that are infected and they need of course to go to, into quarantine and then also if they are infected or sick they need to be treated. So this has put a, uh, an additional um, pressure on the uh, reception uh, facilities uh, for uh, receiving irregular uh, migrants uh, in Europe. But I would like this opportunity to talk about two thing, other things. And one, uh, of course, we already heard a lot from Mr. Spindelegel on the impact uh, of, of the, um, that the pandemic has on, on society and on economy. I will come back to that. But I would also say that with this huge impact on economy and society, when economy and society is weakened by the pandemic, we also see that organized crimes, organized criminal groups are taking advantage of this situation and they are very quick to adapt to this new situation. And uh, for example, we can see that they uh, use uh, these current situations to put people's lives at risk. Uh, and I think this is an important area where we need to cooperate uh, closer between EU and Af African partners. We can see uh, that this uh, fragile economic and social context already appears to have an effect on new business models of criminal organizations involved in migrant smuggling. And we need to uh, focus on joint efforts to combat this kind of, of human smuggling that putting people's lives at risk. Uh, on Monday, uh, we're going to have a conference on anti-smuggling hosted by Italy. Uh, with, uh, of course, I will be there uh, and the Commission will be there and some of the important African uh, partners neighboring the European mm -hmm. Union will be there as well and we will discuss this uh, topic together. Considering the impact of the pandemic on the socioeconomic condition of migrants, there can also be an impact on irregular flows. In this context, migration monitoring and forecasting play an important role to the preparedness of transit and destination countries. 
And there's also an area where I see that it's important that we cooperate. We also have this huge uh, impact on the ec on economy, uh, an economic downturn that uh, for the European Union, uh, it's like it, it's the worst economic crisis that we ever seen since the European Union was founded. And this, of course, needs a huge response in the European Union, but also outside, together with our partners. And this will, of course, when we see unemployment and poverty, there's a huge risk that this will affect uh, vulnerable people and migrants more than others. So this is an important area where we need to have uh, a huge uh, response uh, to, uh, to fight this. I think that this pandemic shows uh, that multilateral cooperation is more needed than ever. A global challenge needs a global response. It's only together that we can bring about recovery and help those who suffer the most from the virus, vulnerable people such as migrants, refugees and displaced persons. And such approach will include continued and strengthened, tailor-made, comprehensive and mutually beneficial partnerships with partner countries and regions. As well as what this is also what I really would like to stress, a strong coordinated multilateral response that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johansson. Um, thank you also for highlighting uh, the important role that migrants play in the European society, but also the new dangers which come forward from the uh, adaptability of, of organized crime groups. Um, a second question, which I would like to uh, focus uh, on Commissioner El Hadid and Commissioner Samate, will look at the mid and, and long term consequences on COVID 19, on migration and mobility in Africa. Um, in particular, uh, it would be interesting to elaborate on how COVID-19 will affect border governance, labor migration, the fight against irregular migration, return with mission, flows of remittances, um, internal displacement, as well as uh, the very important plans related to the continental free movement agenda. How could the negative possible effects of the COVID-19 on the above mentioned issues be mitigated and are there possibly any new opportunities which have been created due to the need for closer cooperation due to the present crisis. I would like to invite Commissioner El Fadil to, from her perspective and from her responsibility, sh uh, share with us the possible long-term impact of COVID-19 and how we can um, see how we can mitigate the impact of this crisis and actually maybe grab some new opportunities which the crisis could offer. Thank you. Commissioner, please, floor yours. Thank you very much, um, Martin. Uh, as you said, uh, there is a very big impact because of uh, the close down of the borders. Um, there is more restrictive uh, border measures uh, being put in place uh, to, to uh, curtail uh, cross-border uh, mobility or movement. Um, there is massive uh, delays at the border points for the people and for the goods uh, on transit. And uh, as you know that in many African countries, there is uh, the people who live on the border between the two countries, they have their trades. Um, I can give an example that, uh, for example, between uh, Rwanda uh, and Uganda, they told me there is thousands of people they travel across the border every day. There is between Rwanda and DRC. So this border trade now is very much affected uh, and because of these uh, new restrictions. Um, also, uh, labor migration is, uh, is affected. There is forced returns. I spoke about it in my open, uh, opening remarks. Uh, there is exploitation of migrants workers. Uh, violation and abuse of their human rights it's happening um, there is policies being put and the only policies but introduced because of this COVID-19 policies and guidelines uh, for migrants workers and um, also uh, it relates to the massive uh, deportations uh, the fight against against uh, irregular migration it continues um, um, the situation in Libya, we all follow up what is happening 
uh, in Libya, but Libya continue, in spite of the political situation in Libya, uh, Libya continue to be one of the main uh, routes for migration, mm -hmm. in spite of all the risks. My expectation is that with this risk of COVID-19, we'll have less attempted uh, migra migrations uh, through Libya, but unfortunately, the reality is not that. Still, people are trying uh, to uh, go through Libya, and they end up stranded uh, in, in Libya. And uh, I think uh, not us, not you, nobody knows the exact uh, situation of the stranded migrants in Libya now. Uh, our last visit was one year ago. Uh, there is, yes, some organizations are still in Libya, and they are following up. But nobody can say that we have a very accurate data on how many stranded migrants, if there is new detention centers or there is a closing down of something, we don't know. Me, from my side, the information I get uh, is not very uh, updated or accurate. And so we don't know. Uh, Libya continue to be a risk because of uh, the uh, political uh, situation uh, in Libya. And also, I agree uh, with uh, Commissioner Yelva uh, that uh, the activity of the transnational organized crime uh, or criminal groups is increasing and increasing. And uh, human traffickers, they have new ways, they have developed uh, new business models. I agree totally with what uh, the Commissioner said, and this also should should uh, be one of the points we, we discuss in this meeting and then we look for how are we going to work with the law enforcement agencies in every member states, uh, in Libya, in Europe, uh, Afropol, Europol, all these people, they have to uh, pay more attention uh, to this increase of, of uh, the human trafficking. Uh, and they are using COVID-19 also uh, in this area and they are profiting uh, from this situation. I think uh, in general I can say that the socioeconomic impact of this COVID-19 uh, is affecting all our member states, it's affecting all the population in Africa, but also it affects more the migrants, the refugees, and uh, the IDPs. So what we need, we need um, a short-term plan to deal with the current situation. Uh, we need, as also I would like to agree again uh, with Commissioner Yelva, that we need more cooperation on the multilateral level. We need a mid-term plan, we need a medium, uh, a long-term plan on what are we going to do, because as I said earlier, nobody knows when this COVID-19 will be over. But even if we develop a vaccine by the end of the year, the effect of COVID-19 will continue with us the rest of this year and in 2021. So we need to plan ahead and to see what can we do uh, together as partners, whether through the uh, established mechanisms we have or to innovate something new or to have something new, but we need to agree very quickly on what we can do uh, to mitigate the impact of this COVID-19 uh, on the population uh, of migrants, IDBs, and refugees. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I think indeed the, the last point is, is, is very important to see how can we foresee different scenarios and how can we prepare for those. Um, Commissioner Samata, uh, the African Union, as we all know, has uh, major ambitions with regard to promotion of freedom of movement. Um, Will these ambitions be possibly affected by COVID-19 and, and what can be done to keep the uh, uh, ABC agenda in this regard on, on, on track? Commissioner, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I want to recall that uh, when we adopted African Union uh, leadership adopted in 2018 the protocol on free movement, uh, it was uh, a very important uh, uh, flagship for African Union because we want to boost intra Africa trade, investment, commerce, and uh, tourism, and uh, 
to allow um, African to move freely in Africa to improve our economy. And this flagship, important flagship, complete our CFT. But with uh, the issue of COVID, it became a very difficult situation because uh, when the protocol was adopted, we, uh, we were uh, uh, sensitizing our member state to, to uh, ratify this uh, protocol. It was a little bit slow uh, because out of 55 countries, uh, uh, 32 have signed the protocol and only four member states are deposit ratification uh, to the protocol. We have uh, Rwanda, Sao Tome, Principe, Niger, and Mali. And we, we, we need uh, 15 ratification to come uh, for this protocol to come in force, into force. But with this COVID situation, it became more difficult to have uh, member states uh, ratifying this uh, protocol and we face now as uh, we mentioned at the beginning the closure of border border due to the issue of health we have uh, national security and many laws restricting um, movement of uh, people and uh, we see also alt global trade abrupt fall on in communities prices and um, foreign uh, exchange it was low in africa but with pandemic it the situation became worse that affected uh, negatively the fo foreign financial flow also and uh, reduce uh, tourist tourism and um, alting uh, labor market and uh, we face also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what will be important for us is uh, to continue our sensitization uh, of member states. We need assistance for that one to convince them that uh, COVID doesn't have to stop uh, this issue of uh, free movement. And uh, I can see also free COVID-19 as a uh, wicked uh, made uh, weak uh, the technical capacity of member state to address uh, health issue and the easy thing is saying to close borders and uh, to stop uh, people is became uh, difficult and to ban uh, travel and uh, also um, uh, to to avoid free movement of person what can be done for that uh, this is a very important question uh, and for us we need uh, a solution which integrate a comprehensive strat strategy to guide uh, our members to both lockdown measure and also opening the borders uh, to allow free movement of person and goods also. We need uh, to ensure uh, health security for uh, travelers and also protect people from uh, COVID-19. We need also support uh, to member state in terms, I talk about the found concerning uh, uh, COVID, uh, which can include also this issue of humanitarian and also free movement of people. We need, uh, the support to, to develop uh, integrated public health approach that take care of travels, including uh, uh, existing public health policies and also uh, to promote at the same time global mobility. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, we need uh, our uh, agency also to complete the work of uh, Africa CDC to take care of uh, this uh, situation in Africa. And uh, that is why we are working uh, hardly to establish uh, this, uh, this agency and uh, to help to prioritize our, uh, our uh, work and also to help our member state to, to face this COVID with uh, allowing people to, to have free move and movement. Without uh, this free movement, we won't achieve our flagship project, CFTA. We won't achieve also the development and peace and security in Africa. This is uh, some issues I want to share with you. And, uh, uh, how, to, the way, uh, how to strengthen cooperation uh, uh, 
the two commissioners uh, mentioned it. Uh, it is important to strengthen cooperation between the EU and uh, African Union on the issue uh, of uh, COVID-19 and at the same time to promote free movement and also to protect our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you very much for your uh, the very concrete uh, proposals. Uh, yesterday, we had um, organized an event for, uh, at ICBD for our member states to look at uh, how to reopen freedom of movement uh, and, and lift internal Schengen controls. And we have had speech uh, con uh, contributions from various member states. And we saw already that within the member states um, uh, of the European Union and within the Schengen area, how complicated both the closure but also the reopening is. Um, and uh, I think what, what also um, uh, Commissioner Johansson said before, um, sharing lessons learned, sharing experiences uh, between different countries, both within Africa, between different regions in Africa, but also between uh, on, on an international level and uh, continent to continent approach would be uh, very important. Uh, Commissioner Johansson, the present commission, as we have heard both from you and from my director general, has, has great ambitions in its cooperation with Africa. Uh, was also seen by the College to College meeting in February. Um, could you maybe elaborate on, on what the EU has done up to now uh, and what is planned in terms of its cooperation and solidarity with the African partners to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, especially with regard to mobility and displacement? Um, does the EU expect an impact uh, of COVID-19 on the migration between Africa and the EU, uh, both for legal and irregular migration? And do you think this will have an impact on the EU's policy responses? Um, for example, with regard to the forthcoming uh, migration pact. I know it's forthcoming, I hope not secret, but if you can say a few words on, the, on this question, I would be grateful. Commissioner Johnson, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um... As I already said, this crisis can only be solved if we all, uh, as a one global community, work together and show solidarity to each other. And uh, many African partners are facing a challenge of hosting large refugee communities. The European Union responded immediately to the United Nations call for a global response using all to tools at our disposal. We are the largest global donor supporting refugees and displaced persons. And in our global response, uh, the European Union acting as Team Europe, both the EU institutions and member states together are taking comprehensive and decisive actions to tackle the impact of COVID-19. So far, more than 36 billion euros has been secured for this. We support the healthcare and socioeconomic measures, refugees, displaced persons, and also their host communities are part of our response. We are supporting uh, uh, increased access to health systems for migrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, and their host communities. And these measures concern mainly the sectors of health and water, sanitation, and hygiene. Let me give you three examples of what we are doing. First, in early May, we launched the EU humanitarian air bridge, which already brought 350 metric tons of medical and humanitarian equipment, as well as humanitarian staff, especially to, to Sudan and Somalia, and repatriated people in need in full cooperation with our member states. Second, Example, the Central African Republic benefited from the first Team Europe humanitarian air bridge, bringing in health equipment and humanitarian staff to support the fight against the pandemic in the country. This had been complemented by a 6.5 million euro financial package to help the water, sanitation and health sector. The distribution of medical equipment and local produ production of masks have been stepped up. Our president, Ursula von der Leyen, organized a pledging conference on the 4th of May for developing a vaccine. And this pledging conference reached 7.4 billion euros. The EU has also established a rescue stockpile of medical capacities. There has been international collaboration on development and assessment of COVID-19 medicines focused on increasing the efficiency of regulatory process and decision making. 
For this initiative, the European Medicines Agency has been cooperating with me medicine regulatory authorities worldwide under the umbrella of International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. You asked also about the uh, impact uh, that we can uh, for foresee uh, for the pandemic uh, when it comes to migration uh, towards European Union. I think it's very uh, clear that there will be an impact I think it's a bit risky to say what kind of impact it will be. Uh, of course, uh, if we will face uh, heavily uh, poverty and unemployment and economic downturn, that will force people on the other hand. We can also see, as I already mentioned, how criminal groups are using poor people uh, in a very terrible way uh, to try to benefit from new kind of ways of earning money and risking their lives. But we have also seen in these uh, days uh, new forms of solidarity, um, people opening their hearts to help each other. So I think that it for sure will be an impact, but I think it's a bit difficult to say exactly how it will be. I will soon present uh, the new proposal for migration and asylum in the European Union. This has been uh, an area that has been very uh, with high tensions inside the European Union. Of course, my task is difficult to find a way forward that can be accepted by all member states. But uh, the, my uh, proposal will uh, will take a starting point that migration is something normal. Migration has always been here. Migration will always be here. And migration is a good thing, but we need to manage migration much better than we do today. And to be able to do that, uh, partnership and collaboration together with our partners uh, outside the European Union is uh, the most uh, important aspect. So therefore, I would like to build strong partnerships to deal with and to develop uh, the area of managing migration together with partners. And that will be uh, the main, uh, actually, um, message from, from the new uh, package that I will present uh, in September. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, apologies for shortly leaving the screen. I have a technical issue to deal with. Um, indeed, I think um, your last sentences brought us also to the um, the next topic, the next question I would like to ask. Um, I like against the background of, of these discussions uh, and uh, what we have heard of so far, to what extent might COVID-19 have an impact on, on the migration partnership, on, on the, the partnership between the EU and AU on migration and mobilities? And, and what are the key objectives you have with regard to this partnership? I would like to ask all three commissioners to react. Uh, and this will also be, let's say, the final part of our debate before we go to questions from the floor. I would like to invite you to keep your interventions um, short so that we can uh, have sufficient time, some 15 minutes, uh, for asking uh, questions. I would like to ask uh, Commissioner uh, El Fadil to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Martin, and uh, thank you to Commissioner Yelva uh, on her last comments. And uh, before going into answering this question, uh, I would like also to appreciate uh, the support we received from the European Union uh, to, to Africa CDC, I'm sorry, to Africa CDC, and to also our um, fund, the anti-COVID-19 fund, which has been mentioned by Commissioner uh, Minata earlier. We have uh, cre created this fund because we have financial problems uh, and I see I can say that shortages uh, not uh, really problems but the heads of the states of governments and they uh, in their one of their meetings and they con convened many meetings as a bureau they decided on the establishment of the anti-COVID-19 response fund uh, and um, the, the chair of the commission plus myself and the director of Africa CDC, we immediately engaged our member states. We uh, created the fund We, uh, with a legal counsel. We have approved uh, the structure of this fund. And we have also engaged the private sector of Africa. The pledge is made uh, to the fund 
um, it's around 100 million do dollars so far. Uh, we are expecting uh, more pledges, but I would like to appreciate uh, the pledges made by the European Union. Uh, we have received uh, from member states directly, but also from the European Union. There is an ongoing uh, conversation between Africa CDC and the European Union. Uh, we, so some member states, we requested them uh, to give us in kind. Uh, I can give the example of Germany. Germany pledged uh, 10 million euros to the Africa CDC, but we requested Germany that we prefer to receive it as testing kits. And that's what's, what's going on now. They, we will receive it, they agreed, we will receive it, but from the European Union, uh, I don't uh, have with me the, ex the exact figure, but I think around 39 million dollars in total that will be will come as support for Africa CDC and the anti-COVID-19 response fund. I just wanted to, to appreciate uh, before going on uh, to answer your question, uh, Martin. The question on, uh, sorry, I think I need some water. The question on um, the previous discussions and how uh, COVID-19 is impacting the, the partnership on migration and mobility. I think um, we need to enforce what we have already. All the mechanisms, all the process, for term process, report process, uh, Valletta conference, uh, all the mechanisms we have, uh, the task force, the AU, EU, uh, UN task force, which she proved itself as a very effective uh, mechanism. We need to reinforce these mechanisms. And we need uh, to continue working through all these processes. Uh, even virtually, we have to, to continue with the scheduled meetings and the scheduled activities. Um, the rock issue uh, still uh, needs more discussions. I, I just met uh, the head of the European Union delegation uh, last week uh, in my office. Uh, and we spoke about the rock and the rock that's going to be the cock, uh, is going to be a, uh, an, an Africa Union uh, center. We still need uh, more discussion. There is some areas it needs more uh, elaboration. We have the other two centers. We are now establishing the center in Mali and the center uh, and the, the observatory in Morocco. And we need the support uh, of the European Union in the full establishment and the operationalization of these three centers of migration. Because these three centers, for me, it is a new uh, opportunity to address migration issues in Africa. We have three centers. We can consider the Morocco one for North Africa, the Khartoum one for East Africa, and the Mali one for West Africa. And then in the future, we'll, we'll see if we need uh, to establish in Central Africa and, South, and Southern Africa region. So these three centers are still under establishment. I remember in my last meeting, also Martin, I mentioned these three centers. And for me, I would like to see uh, these three centers up and running before the end of 2020. We are working with my director to make sure that this can happen uh, with the support of the hosting countries. I think also the AU, EU, UN Tripartite Task Force, uh, we agreed to extend it to the Sahel region, uh, but unfortunately, we did so little on this. We need to make sure that also we can accelerate our processes in this area. We need also this uh, task force to continue working on the issue of the stranded migrant in, in migrant, uh, migrants in Libya, but also to extend to the Sahel region. And Commissioner Minato just mentioned that there is uh, new challenges also emerging in the Sahel region, the terrorist groups are continuing, and we need also to look uh, into how we can uh, help uh, the Sahel region in addressing such issues, and they, especially when it is related uh, to migration, migration issues. Um, the continent-to-continent -continent dialogue, this is very important. We had uh, many meetings on this continent-to-continent -continent dialogue on the two levels, technical and political level. This also dialogue should continue. Um, I know we were expecting uh, to have our summit before the 2020, the AU-EU summit. 
I don't know what will happen now. Are we going uh, to the, according to the proposed um, schedule uh, dates or are we going to change it? But also for us, it's an opportunity uh, to raise up these issues around migration uh, in, the, in, the, in the summit. Um, okay. I think we, we need to continue. We need to continue this very important uh, partnership between the European Union uh, and uh, the African Union. We, we remain ready to be to engage in time. Um, for us, it is a very important uh, area, the area uh, that relates to issues to do with migration, refugees and IDBs. For me, I always take them as one package. And we work very closely, uh, the two departments, social affairs and political affairs. But we would like to see results. And I mm -hmm. always ask myself about how are we going to achieve tangible results, like what we did in repatriating more than 40,000 uh, migrants from, from Libya to their countries of origin, or to take them uh, to Niger and, 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 and uh, Rwanda, uh, our, our uh, mechanism uh, that uh, some countries can uh, host, like the one we did with, with Rwanda. It's also a very successful uh, solution so far. It's a successful solution. It is, yes, been interrupted also by COVID-19, but we uh, I can uh, end by saying that all the mechanisms we have, we need to mobilize it to the maximum. And also we can have an opportunity if we new mechanisms we need to be produced. But uh, the thing we, we need, we can do now, now is to continue the continent to continent dialogue, to continue with our regular uh, meetings and activities, just change it from being physical or face-to-face -to, -face to online meetings, but we have to keep our scheduled uh, meetings as being uh, proposed. Thank you very much. And I would like to wish uh, Commissioner Elva uh, very good luck with her representations in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Same question for uh, Commissioner uh, Samata. What are your expectations for the future cooperation between the EU and African Union? Thank you very much. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, Africa, I'm quite sure for that. I'm sure you too. We cannot successfully uh, fight uh, COVID-19 alone. That uh, sure. We need uh, international cooperation because the threat and the impact of uh, COVID is global. And uh, Commissioner, you, asked, you and Son uh, mentioned it. We need uh, gro global uh, response also because the impact on uh, economy, political issues, uh, humanitarian are uh, huge. And uh, we need uh, uh, as African Union to complete wa what uh, Commissioner Amira said, to intensify advocacy and popularization of uh, our protocol. And uh, we have response, yes, we have uh, we, we, we have to continue the fight to have a, a free movement. And what can be done is to continue. We are planning to have um, a champion, uh, uh, a head of state. It, the process was uh, at the last step when uh, this COVID situation happened. We need uh, a champion to advocate and we need your support also to be sure that we will have more countries ratifying this protocol. And also we need a strategic leadership, uh, including EU, um, EU strategic partnership framework, and also well uh, resource implementation plan of uh, this uh, issue of free movement uh, with uh, uh, the impact of COVID and uh, the massive uh, impact also on uh, migration, uh, as uh, Amira said, is global migrant, uh, vulnerable person. We need to focus uh, 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 on a, a, to fight this uh, uh, COVID situation and to also take care of uh, this vulnerable mm -hmm. situation. We cannot do that one without a, a strategic leadership. I'm happy to, to listen from uh, 
Ilva Johansson uh, about uh, cooperation to build, I appreciate the, to build strong partnership. This one is uh, very important. And uh, I'm a little bit uh, sad because uh, I remember when uh, I resumed in 2017, I visited Bruxelles. I was there and I was, uh, I went uh, to European Union uh, uh, commissioner. I visited uh, in charge of this humanitarian issue to see how we can strengthen cooperation with uh, uh, the commissioner in, in uh, uh, in this area of humanitarian free movement, but uh, till now I didn't see um, impact. I, I hope uh, we will have uh, more cooperation on the issue of free movement and uh, humanitarian uh, situation. And uh, to, to, to finish, uh, it's important to strengthen cooperation and today's uh, meeting is very important to see what we can do together. These are some key areas and I won't forget uh, our humanitarian agency. Uh, we cannot have a humanitarian agency without the support of our partner. That's why I was uh, in Brussels to discuss, to learn from European Union what you are doing as European Union in the issue on the issue of uh, humanitarian refugees, ITBs, we learn, but uh, we need more. Uh, we need to to see a concretization of uh, this cooperation in the area of um, of uh, humanitarian. I, I have cooperation in many sectors, political sectors, with European Union. That I need more about uh, that situation and this one is very important and I'm happy to see uh, that we are all engaged to strengthen cooperation uh, between our institution uh, to find a solution on this important issue of uh, COVID uh, and free move movement and uh, a vulnerable person in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Johansson, um, Having listened to uh, uh, the, the, the contributions from, from both commissioners, what is the perspective of the EU and your expectations on the future partnership? Um, in a few minutes, you already touched upon it in your previous statement, but maybe you have some, some additions to make in this corner. Madam Jones. Thank you. Uh, just uh, before the pandemic hits us very hard, and in March this year, uh, the European Union adopted its policy on the strategic partnership with Africa. And the objectives set uh, in there are even more valid when it considering the COVID-19 impact. Intense dialogue with our African counterparts to define actions to deliver tangible results are needed and African Union uh, has a paramount role in this process. Just one example, uh, we are now, uh, in one week, uh, the European leaders will meet, hopefully, to agree on a huge, huge recovery packet that we have presented from the Commission to deal with uh, the impact uh, and economic crisis uh, that's coming at the aftermath of the COVID-19. Uh, we have presented this huge uh, recovery fund called Next Generation EU. And a significant part of that uh, recovery fund is designated to uh, our uh, partners uh, in other countries. Because we know that we can't fight this alone. We need to work together and we need to work in solidarity and we need to work uh, as a global response. So that's why a significant part of the European recovery fund is designated to our part partner countries. And of course, when it comes to, to migration specifically, uh, we all need uh, that we need migration. <laughs> we all need that we need to deal with this uh, together to manage migration uh, effectively. And from the European Union side, of course, we will continue to pay particular attention to vulnerable, including women, children, unaccompanied minors and persons with disabilities. And we will also remain committed to helping our, our uh, African partners addressing refugee crisis and find durable solutions for refugees in hosting countries. Preventing irregular migration is a key priority in managing migration in an orderly way. And that includes stepping up on fighting uh, against the smuggling of migrants uh, with our African partners. 
Uh, our cooperation on returns, voluntary returns and the readmission and effective return rates should improve as soon as uh, possible uh, due to the uh, pandemic and the travel restrictions. We have worked quite a good together with this to, to uh, support voluntary returns. And one element of our cooperation I would like to stress is uh, what also was mentioned by Commissioner Amira, uh, uh, is the African Union, European Union, United Nations tripartite task force in Libya on voluntary returns and reintegration. Together, we have supported more than 52,000 migrants to voluntarily return to their countries of origin with reintegration support. Based on our achievements, the experience of our cooperation in the tripartite task force can be useful in other region, regions as well, case by case, as also was mentioned by Commissioner Amira. I would also stress that we focus uh, maybe a bit more also on reintegration. It's important that people can find a new start when they come back uh, uh, in this uh, schemes of voluntary uh, returns. We need also in parallel uh, to step up our, on our cooperation on legal migration uh, that could, could provide mutual benefits. Providing employment opportunities that match the needs of the labor market in both countries. Projects on legal and circular migration um, and labor mobility with African partners could significantly contribute to regular and safe migration and mobility to Europe. And it's important that this is tailored in a way that is mutually benefiting, uh, like a win-win-win situation, both for the European Union, for African partners, and for uh, the, the person that actually is uh, moving. I think that our cooperation so far has brought some success, but we all agree that we need to, to do more. So we should continue our dialogue, building on our successes and achievements. And I also already mentioned one of those with the voluntary returns. I think that this has a good opportunity that we can do even more also in other areas. Uh, and uh, I look, for, for, look, for, look forward to our future cooperation with African Union on migration and mobility, working within and complementing the existing bilateral and regional fr frameworks, including Valletta. So we need to work closer together. And personally, I look forward to uh, engage uh, personally more together with the European Union, uh, together with African Union, together with you uh, commissioners, and also of course with our partner countries uh, in Africa. Thank you, uh, commissioner. Um, and thank you also for um, all three commissioners for very proactively de facto answering uh, 95 percent of, of the questions that we have received uh, via the chat. Uh, the last one which was not yet answered was the one um, focusing on, on, on labor migration. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you for, for your statement and also for all three commissioners for very proactively uh, answering the um, uh, the questions that have been asked in the question and answer because you have not seen them but we have followed them carefully and uh, we've seen that actually many of the questions that were put forward were, were answered and in uh, light of also the time and the, the, the agenda that you have that you have to uh, leave uh, many of you in, in the coming 10 minutes um, I would like um, to invite uh, Her Excellency uh, Madam Markerson uh, who is present mandate covers cooperation between the EU and Africa and who was recently nominated as uh, ambassador to the EU, of the EU to the African Union. And I would like to invite um, you, Ms. Markerson, to give your main takeaway um, of, of the discussion that you've heard uh, and, and what are your, uh, your main messages that you will uh, also use for your, your, um, the, the function that you have been uh, appointed for. Ms. Markerson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I feel very honored to, to have this opportunity to, to sum up a few takeaways. I, of course, um, look very much forward to the future, but right now, of course, I, I, I speak as, um, as director, deputy managing director um, in the external action service. What I have 
Thank you very much. I think it was a very, as always, a very committed uh, commissioners. Um, and I, I just want to take away uh, our three, I will cut across the various uh, questions and, uh, and issues, but I've divided it into three types of, uh, of takeaways. Uh, one that is very overall, what's the overall analysis where there are some, some common issues. Then I, the second one would be on the type of effects that we see of the COVID-19 on the African, but also on the European uh, continent. And last, what are the type of political responses that the uh, three commissioners have pointed to and ha which have also, as, as you said, uh, Martin, come to the front from the many questions from the participants, uh, which I have also tried to follow. But if I look at the first category, what's, what's really um, the main overall analysis that is shared? I have four words, I think, that captures this from, from the commissioners. One thing is uh, the special situation I think we have not seen before in, in our history is like El Fadil said, Commissioner El Fadil, this is, this is something that is affecting us all. Uh, and I, I just, I know it's something we all uh, realizing, but I think it's a very important takeaway just to underline that it is an accelerator on many of the uh, existing situations that we're seeing uh, Commissioner Johansson called it the worst economic crisis that we've seen and that I think uh, is something uh, that we have to also reflect a lot about. That in the overall analysis that comes down to what all three commissioners have talked about is the solidarity which brings us back to this is something that is affecting us all. So I think that is, that is an important takeaway of how we characterize this situation. If I then look at the second category of the type of effects that were mentioned by the commissioners, I think it is um, really important to, to look at all three commissioners talk about the vulnerable groups. Uh, we have a focus today on, on migrants and that was, uh, I think El Fadil very much described the situation for the vulnerable groups. Um, uh, Samate talked about uh, also the issue of the criminal groups and, and how they take advantage of this. This was also from, from Commissioner Johansson, which I think Commissioner Johansson also said something in line with, this, with the uh, issue of solidarity, that migrants are part of, of, of us, part of our societies, and, and we have also shown, seen the links here uh, during the crisis, um, and I think that is quite important. Again, still on what we have seen as important, of course, what we've seen is the slowdown in terms of, of the free movement. Um, obviously, I mean, uh, our continents have, have, have closed down, but that has major, major implications. Um, and Samantha talked about the uh, protocol of free movement and the implications on, on that important work. Um, Last thing on the effects uh, that was mentioned by several is the situation in Libya, which I think uh, we will have to, to follow. This is, um, this is a key issue. We've seen some success in the trilateral cooperation and the task force uh, that we have had between AU, EU and UN was mentioned by, by several of, of all commissioners, I think. That brings me to, to what type of political responses did we um, hear from the three uh, commissioners? I think the, what, what is uh, most important is uh, El Fadil described how the African Union had actually quite quickly come forward and formulated the strategic and political frameworks in place um, very early on, which is quite important. I noted that uh, Samante talked about, which is um, that, that we will still have a holistic and human rights based approach. I think this is, this is something where the AU and the EU also have, have a lot in common. Um, multilateralism was a political response that was mentioned uh, from the European Union. Obviously, the Team Europe response is, is very important and has been quite forcefully. Um, the new pact that Commissioner Johansson uh, will, will soon um, present uh, and, uh, and the types of uh, other, uh, the next generation EU uh, is also quite important and that's coming up next week. So to, to finalize what uh, these policy uh, responses, one of the commissioners said, let's reinforce what we have. Um, and let's, the last one of course, uh, 
the summit that is coming up in October will be uh, a main uh, event uh, for actually taking these uh, different and new stronger partnerships that all um, that all commissioners talked about. And I can't help also underlining um, what Commissioner Fadil said about also maintaining what we have right now, the continent to continent types of partnerships between the EU and, and the African Union. So thank you very much for this very privileged uh, role that I was given. I hope I tried to summarize what the overall characteristics are, what are the some the things that we're seeing that are quite uh, worrying, of course, but there are also important things that where we can look forward in terms of what type of policy responses are needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Your Excellency, and thank you for uh, all um, commissioners and Director General to be present today and to stay for the full 90 minutes. Um, I would like to thank all the participants that... Uh... Can I have one minute, Martin? Yes, please, please Commissioner okay. Fadid, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, Bridget uh, Markeson uh, and uh, to congratulate her in advance before coming to Addis Ababa. We welcome you. Uh, we worked very closely with Ambassador Ramiri and I believe we achieved uh, a lot uh, during his tenure, but also we are looking forward to having you in Addis Ababa and we will continue with uh, the same level of partnership, if not more. Uh, thank you for the very good uh, summary uh, of the main outcomes of this meeting. But also, Martin, I would like to thank you and to thank uh, ICMPD for convening this meeting and also the previous meeting. Thank you very much for the role you are playing in developing uh, the policies on migration and uh, we appreciate your role and the role of all your team and the role of the director and also we hope to continue uh, our very close partnership. Thank you. Thank you Commissioner. Thank you Commissioner. Um, if if uh, Commissioner Johansson, um, Commissioner Samata would like to, to add to this. Commissioner Samata, I saw you raise your hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, we won't have time to reply. I saw many questions uh, uh, in the platform about uh, the, come on, the, uh, they, some people were saying they are bilingual, but there is no French translation. It's, uh, it's true. Je uh, vais peut-être aller en anglais. Il y en a qui ont demandé, Martin, uh, la question de la nature ou de la régularisation uh, des migrants. Je pense que nous profitons de cette question pour, nous l'avons dit aux États membres de l'Union africaine, que l'Union européenne puisse considérer uh, cette question de, de la pandémie du COVID pour régulariser la situation uh, de certains des migrants africains. Il y en a aussi, il y a, il y a beaucoup de questions, on n'aura pas le temps de répondre à toutes ces questions et dire que le travail continue pour nous assurer que euh, dans cette coopération, il faut, il faut aussi tenir compte de cette importante question des migrants, des personnes déplacées internes et également euh, des personnes vulnérables d'une manière générale. Je voulais remercier, euh, vous remercier, Martine, et remercier uh, I'm, I'm seeing commissioner, she's, she's saying she, she cannot understand anything, but uh, to say thank you to you, Martin, <laughs> to your organization, and also to commissioner uh, Ilva, and uh, to all of you. And uh, I hope uh, this is the second time we are working together to be sure that we will continue and strengthen cooperation. And uh, I'm very happy to see Brigitte coming in Ethiopia after Burkina, Brussels, she's coming in Ethiopia. Uh, I hope it will, it will be very soon uh, and we are happy to see you and uh, ready to work with you on the, these issues and also to strengthen cooperation between the European Union and the African Union is not only this issue of humanitarian, we have also human rights, we have also peace and security and preventing uh, uh, conflict in Africa with the issue of governance, we will be happy to work with you and thank you very much to all organizers of this important uh, webinar today.
Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your warm words. Indeed, uh, in this case, we were uh, working only, only in English, um, uh, also for technical reasons, uh, but we will also ensure that in future meetings we will focus on the French. I thank you very much for the points you raised. I would like to invite uh, Commissioner Johansson maybe for some final words. Commissioner Johansson. Thank you. I just also want to, to thank uh, you, uh, ICMPD, and you, Martin, for uh, how you have organized this. And just a short uh, response to Commissioner Samate on the regularization of, of migrants. Uh, this has been actually taking place in some of the member states during the pandemic, uh, caused by the pandemic, that they regularized people that are already there and gave them access to um, um, full uh, functioning of, of the society and so on. This is a decision for each, each member state, but this has been uh, encouraging to see uh, some of the member states actually uh, regularizing migrants and uh, including them even more in, in the society. So thank you very much for this webinar. And uh, as, I said, as I said before, I'm looking forward to work closely together with you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you very much, all participants, uh, my Director General, three Commissioners, and uh, Excellency Markerson. Um, thank you very much for your very, very insightful remarks. Um, as ICMPD, we look forward to continue working uh, with all of you, both on the continental level, uh, within the framework of the Rabat Katoon process and the Joint Flat Action Plan, as also with regard to the individual work that we're doing in individual African countries. This crisis um, has hit us all with a surprise. Um, we, as a surprise, we look uh, forward to see how can we work together to build a new future together and to uh, ensure the cooperation between the two continents will only flourish in the future. Thank you very much. I'm happy we were able to stay more or less in time and uh, to allow for uh, the continuation of your busy agendas. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you.